Uh, I just finished reading this great book, which I highly recommend, which I gave to my son, but um, to read called, mm. I think I mentioned it before, called The Bernoulli Fallacy. Oh, yeah, actually, I have that in my, um, I bought, I think I bought that book in on Audible, and I haven't listened to it yet. I think it's right. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, is it good? It's, well, I said it was great. It's really not great, but it's really, it's pretty good. Now, why is this knit not working for some reason? What is this thing? It's complaining about something. I should have had this already go. But it's what something I, there's some things I had some, some problems with it. I mean, it does engage in a bit of a straw man argument against uh, frequentist methods in some ways. But just, it's fascinating the whole history of like one of his claims, and I, I, not a spoiler, but one of his claims that he, he says that one of the reasons why the uh, Pearson and Galton and all these guys were so hard over on mm -hmm. being trying to appear as unbiased as possible and rejected Bayesian methods, which required this prior, they wanted, because they really felt it was important to appear that they were, they were letting the data speak for itself, because what they were trying to say with the data was some pretty nasty things, it turns out. Oh, yeah, were, yeah. Uh, there those guys. Genesis. <laughs> yeah, those guys were all, those guys were all. By the way, there's also, I don't, I have the audio book for this, I know there's a book called The Theory That Would Not Die, which is about Bayes, but it's also about. Oh, so. I'll look that up. Yeah. So yeah, actually, I have that's that's awesome that you because I actually own that audio book and I need to listen to it, but I haven't taken the time. But yeah, um, so many of those or like late nineteenth century guys, you know, they were all so everybody was sort of wrapped up in like this this like logical positivism kind of philosophy of, you know, everything is uh, it, hypothesis, you know, yeah. rejection, and everything. It's like all about this perception of objectivity because that's what we see in you know physics and cosmos that's right too he does talk about that in the Bayes rule uh, Bay, Bay, in the Bernoulli fallacy book too he talks about how they were trying to put in a science trying to make it the sociology and these kind of things a science somehow yeah to make well, it right make, make it firmer and harder science the reason why I brought that up because it mentioned normal and non-normal you know, some people, hey, just act normal or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And there is a connection between the normal distribution and, and the first things they were studying was human characteristics. In fact, a lot of the terminology we use, right? That's yeah. what we talked about in this book too, is like populations and whatnot, right? Uh, comes from that yeah. study. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, it's that's a lot. in some ways, isn't it? Oh, that's <laughs> well, kind of the, yeah. So, God bless yeah. these rules, right? <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and, 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 and the others. And yeah. Fisher also was just like a real jerk. Um, I mean, there's just Apparently. so many. There's yeah, so yeah. many. I mean, it's, it's the spot. The, in, in addition to the eugenics stuff, he yeah. was also. Oh no, just, this comes out in the book too. Yeah, he just it's, does. He's he's very. He just hated any kind of um, thing that was different from what he wanted to do. That's but that, that whole section of the book is really interesting. But it's also true in my view that's sort of a straw man, right? You're just attacking yeah. the person. You're no. I'm yeah. sorry. There's that's more an ad hominem attack, right? Yeah, which is fine. Then there's also a straw man attack. He does a little bit, I think, in the way he builds up some of the things, some of the counter examples, like where frequentist goes wrong. Like, I don't think an actual frequentist, real good statistics person would like fall into that trap necessarily. However, yeah. the whole p-value hacking and all the rest of that, that's solid. That's just great stuff. So yeah, for sure. Anyway, yeah. I digress a little bit. Yeah. Um, this is the uh, can you guys see my screen now? And is it yep. readable enough? Yes. yes. Excellent. So this is the final unit, right? The ultimate Ooh. unit, unit four, <laughs> uh, hierarchical models is what we're going to study. Uh, just to, to to help set the stage, if you don't know what, I, what kind of model these are, these are models with grouped or pooled data. And he gives some examples like groups of students. And the data is uh, the some data on individual students within each school. Uh, another example is groups of labs. And the data is multiple observations within each lab, multiple experiments within each lab. Uh, and or a sample group of people, and this is going to be the example in this chapter, the, a sample group of people in which we make multiple individual observations over time on those individu individuals, right? Uh, so in this case, the group is actually a person, right? Because the mm -hmm. single person has multiple measurements on it. So unit four, as we were just saying, has these five chapters. This one's going to introduce the concepts, hopefully motivate why we need these kinds of models. Uh, and I want to emphasize again that this is kind of the one of the killer apps of the Bayesian methods, and it's just, mm -hmm. I believe these kind of things are are difficult to set up <laughs> at best in uh, fr uh, frequentist techniques or orth orthodox techniques or whatever, right? And 
So we're going to introduce that concept. Then we're going to go into chapter 16 next week with Ama. She's going to talk about the most basic kind of hierarchical model. So we learn how to set them up in like Stan. And, and we're not going to learn that in this chapter. We're going to learn that next chapter, like how to actually do the models of this nature. And, you know, I, no, no spoiler, but it turns out it's not that complicated. Again, the great thing about Bayesian methods, this is not that difficult to do. It turns out just, you know, adding some more lines in your model. Okay, this is a hyper prior or whatever, right? That kind of thing. So it's just adding another layer. Uh, then we're going to talk about the more, probably the most common cases, the normal models with predictors. And then Brian, you're going to, I'm sorry, uh, Robert, you're going to cover that, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And then the non-normal ones, Ryan's going to cover. Mm-hmm. Um, binomial, I presume. Actually, I hadn't looked at that chapter, but you you mentioned it might be the bi, uh, bi, I'm, it's going to be all, ca- it's just going to be counts. That's basically yeah, counts. What, okay. Right. Yeah. yeah counts. So, right. Well, yeah. It's the normal they say counts. Anything that, anything that can't have <laughs> integers, you know, it has yeah. to be, uh, you know, you know how yeah. it is. And then uh, finally chapter 19, which I have not looked at at all, but it just says more layers. So I assume this is just like adding another layer on top, but you keep going back, right? Add more well, I think, I, I don't know what, I haven't looked at that, but like typically whenever, I mean, I haven't done this in the Bayesian sense, but I have done, I mean, when I was working in observ- observational research doing, I mean, we call them mixed effects models, you know, or multi-level models, but yeah, a common thing would be like, okay, now we're like, you, you were measuring, you know, kids inside of classrooms, but now we can have schools, you know, nested within districts. And oh, each, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, yeah. and then you can have classrooms nested within schools and then students nested. So you can mean, I, I mean, it's probably too much, but you can have like three, three levels would be like schools and then classrooms and then, yeah. Yeah. I guess at some point you get into a, a bias variance problem, right? You've got too many. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't, too many things to wiggle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, it's better, you know, I guess in the long run, if you have enough data to um, capture everything, capture yeah. all of the, the sources yeah. of variance, but yeah. True. So in this chapter, our objectives are to just explore the limitations of our current modeling toolbox under the two extremes with pool data. One is what they call, they call in this chapter, complete pooling, which is essentially just ignore the grouping entirely uh make one big giant pool and then no pooling which is where you take each individual separately and just fit them separately just right so again we'll look at that real quickly uh we'll, then we'll look at an example of partial pooling which is the hierarchical modeling but then we're not going to do it. we're just going to give you the results and see what the benefits are from it the idea is focus on the big ideas and the rest we will leave to the later chapters so the data that they use in this chapter was the this thing they call the cherry blossom sample, which at first, you know, you're like, what is this about trees? No, it's about a race, apparently. And the data consists of run times. I guess there's more in the data than that, but the only part we're going to look at is for each runner, there's multiple, sometimes not all every runner, but many runners run this race many, many times. So we have their age, we have their time that they managed to complete the race in and the runner number, I, I suppose, on the bottom here. And this is just a box plot of the data just to show that there's a lot of variability between each runner. And you can even see by eye here, there is some, looks like there's some kind of pooling, like some runners are just inherently slower and some runners are just inherently faster, mm-hmm. right? And maybe the and another type of pooling would be, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I just mentioned it now. Another type of pooling would be maybe some, obviously I think some runners would age better than others, <laughs> right? <laughs> just like a wine. <laughs> Right. So yeah. the goal here is to understand the relationship between running time and age. And by the way, as always, sometimes I just go on, just feel free to interrupt me, yell, scream, put the little yellow hand up, whatever you want to do. It doesn't <laughs> matter. Right. So the first attempt would be to use the tools we already have, which is we're just going to ignore the grouping because we don't want to do it with it yet. And we just look at age versus the net time. And we see immediately there doesn't seem to be any kind of dependence on age. No clear trend here. It's just a big blob. Uh, and this does seem strange. You would expect that as you get older, your ability to complete the race should deteriorate, right? To some extent, I mean, sure, I guess, you know, again, there'll be exceptions where some people get more fit perhaps as they get older or some age range. But um, this is people in their, I shouldn't say later age, because this is like my age area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seriously. But I'm not running any races that fast either, so, or at all. Um, uh, just to give an example, he zooms in on three of the runners. Oh, sorry. So in the book, he does do a fit and finds a, a slope consistent with zero. It's slightly positive, but nothing. It's uh, the error bars are big. I didn't put that in here, but it's in the book. Um, and he just does a simple linear regression that we already know how to do. And the error on the slope is 
overlaps well zero is what, he, what that means consistent mm -hmm. with zero so just looking at three examples we can see this fit is pretty terrible right i mean this runner runner number one if he might he might be one of these guys who got better at age or at least at, when he first started he didn't do so well then later he was consistently a little bit faster this runner he got slower with age much more rapidly than this blue line which again it's going up a little bit but it's the air bars aren't here is actually consistent with zero maybe runner 22 it fits pretty good i don't know uh so that's the complete pooling set so we can see that uh, one there's several drawbacks here and the book points out the most important drawback is that these observations within each runner are clearly correlated with each other so one of the fundamental assumptions we make when we make a linear regression like this is we're assuming each data point is independent and identically distributed not well independent and distributed in an identical way right uncorrelated so that's not the case here right mm -hmm. uh and more and probably another aspect of this is it does ignore the information about like i said before individual runners they age differently they have a different beginning uh, when uh, a different um overall average speed that they can run and they age differently so we're totally ignoring that in this model we don't want to do that so in the end we end up with these misleading conclusions if we were trying to guess how fast i would run a race in we would probably get a, an incorrect answer <laughs> i'm guessing it's way up here though this black dot number 120 120 on a good day isn't it also like i forgot this now but like isn't it some people run different numbers of races too isn't it or does everybody yes. does everybody no, you're run? right some people only want to run rate well, that's right one race some people run multiple this is some examples where people have run five races i guess in each case or that's maybe that's why he picked these ones but there's that might be the most i don't actually know but maybe that's the most anyone those are the more yeah, because if there's variability in the number of races, yeah. that's another that's another source of variance that you're trying. That's yeah. that's another reason for doing right. like par partial pooling. So we so this didn't work. The other thing we can do, we know how to do with our current tools, is just okay. The runners are different. Let's just treat them as completely different. Ignore anything else, and do you know? There's 36 runners. We'll just fit 36 different fits. And as you said, some of the runners we only have like one point. <laughs> what kind of mm. fits that going to be? I don't know. Uh, so in the book, he, he shows these three runners, again, the same 120 and 22, same three runners. And this looks much better, right, at first glance. I mean, this one shows this runner getting better with age. This one it, this one captures the fact this guy gets slower, faster with age and captures this guy as well, as well. But looking a little closer, we're saying, wait a minute, do we really believe this runner number one's going to, this trend is right? We're kind of ignoring all the information we know about all the, from all the other runners that generally speaking, people do get slower with age. So that's not in here, right? Uh, and the other big drawback is, uh, we, how do we use this to make a prediction on some new group? We have no idea, right? Each group is individually fit. We have no idea like to predict my, my running time. We can't do that on here um, in any straightforward way. You might say, well, maybe we just average all the slopes or something and weighted average or something. Perhaps that, you know, that would give you some, some kind of prediction. But we would, that's not a very Bayesian method. It doesn't really give us errors and, and confidence and posteriors that we really want, right? So that's the that's that approach. But let's take a step back. We have data that's hierarchical, it's grouped, right? Uh, so this is kind of a new kind of thing we haven't done in all of our tools. And by the way, we have a lot of great tools. Don't get me wrong. This kind of this section of this book right here, this last unit is might be considered more a more advanced topic in in other books. I, I mean, I, I have like a couple other books. Some books don't even talk about this kind of hierarchical thing, which is a shame because, like I said, it is one of the great things mm -hmm. you get for free as part of this, almost for free as part of learning the Bayesian techniques. Yeah. But there is a group structure to the data and we should take advantage of that, right? And again, I mentioned this before, but there is what, you know, in this case, I already talked about this. These are the same three examples. Well, actually, no, I guess, well, these are the similar examples I gave earlier, but what groups are, right? So again, the groups could be schools, observations, uh, students with this, each stool, school, uh, groups could be subjects, right? And the observations are a series of tests. And there's, that's one of the exercises does this with a sleep test and exercise 15, three and the following, right? Or in this case, the groups are runners and mm -hmm. uh, the individual runners and the observations are multiple races. So there's the natural grouping that we want to, to, to capture in our models and the hierarchical modeling will do this for us. It'll provide this partial pooling. Where we'll get insight into both the inside the group variability, how much a particular runner, uh, how much his race times have changed, as well as with between the groups. And this kind of goes to what Ryan was saying before. Like we want to know, like how does when you know school to school in district to district, right? Very. 
So that's the partial pooling. And so uh, we'll see how to do these kind of things next week, but this was just a given in the book, um, these results. So it's just a cut and paste figure. I didn't, re most of the figures here I did reproduce, but this one, I, you, there's no way to do it. Just, they give it to you, right? Um, so these are the same three runners, one, 20, 22, and shown on here are the different models we have. The black solid line is the no pooled uh, model of the, just take all the runtime for pretend that they're independent, even though they're not. The blue lines are the fits to the individual data, the no pooling case. And the dash lines are the pooled fits. So there's a bit of uh, shrinkage, or, or you might say, where each one of these lines is now bent more toward the total complete pooling thing. Um, and they're now all informed by each other, uh -huh. these fits. So, um, for example, if you look at this first runner, you'll see that in the no pool example, we thought he was going to get better with age. Now, we're, now that's been kind of pushed up where now we think he's, well, he's really going to get worse with age in long, in, eventually. And that's what this is showing right here. Uh -huh. And you'll note also that the intercepts are different for each one of these. Each, each one of these lines is individually tailored to this particular um, runner, but it's informed by the, the grouping. And we'll see how to do that. Um, well, for the, the aggression like this, we won't see that until chapter six, uh, chapter 17, but in chapter 16, we'll, we'll see how to build models that are higher like this. 16, sorry. Um, so let's see. And another important, remember we said one of the drawbacks of the complete pooling was that we couldn't make predictions for new runners. Well, now we can. Now we can use the median results for the overall um, pool fit and say, okay, here's how I'm, this dash line is how I'm going to do uh, mm -hmm. the best prediction we can make how I'm going to do on this race. So like 90 minutes, apparently. <laughs> I'm sure there's a big error bar on that, which is not expressed in this graph, but we can pull out of right. the posterior year samples, of course, right? That's one of the great, another great thing about the Bayesian methods yeah. for this. So uh, I guess that's basically the, everything in the whole chapter. This is actually a relatively straightforward, brief chapter. So um, we'll get a little bit of early break today, but we could talk a little about the exercise as well. Um, but we have, I hope, motivated the need for these kinds of models and looked at kind of how these different models work. Um, uh, explored briefly the complete pooling, no pooling, and partial pooling models. Are really the only valid model. Well, the complete pooling model is just not valid, right? Because those samples are not independent. You shouldn't do that. The no pooling, you could press, perhaps argue for, you might want to do that in certain cases, but partial pooling is the one we think is probably the most appropriate model for a group data like that. And I hope I motivated that in the spelling. I hope I remember to fix that. Is there any questions before we move on? Uh -uh. Yeah. I don't think I missed anything. I think it is just a short chapter. It is. Uh, yeah. But let's pull up the uh, book real quick and maybe we can just look briefly at the exercises and then we could probably just, you know, quit early today, which I'm sure Ryan would appreciate because I'm sure he has a meeting. And <laughs> I do have a meet as always. I always have a, I always have a meeting at, at one. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> uh, but any questions? I, yeah. I, uh, nope, I, I think, I mean, I guess um, the only thing I would just say is, is um, as you know, someone who's done, I mean, I, my background actually is in developmental psychology. So, you know, doing longitudinal um, sort of stuff is like, you know, it's implicit to, you know, our mandate as a field we're, we're studying people, you know, over time, right? Children, adolescents, whatever. And so, yeah, I mean, it's important to just note that hierarchical, well, it means a lot of things, but one of the things it can mean is just longitudinal data, right? You, where you have, you know, um, uh, data collection points um, with, you know, within person that can, you know, vary at, you know, at the number, you know, at the number of collection points, maybe, you know, there's, there's some, I, I actually worked for a company where we were trying to do a longitudinal study with like 50,000 people and a bunch of people only had one data point and a bunch of people, other people had two, three, four, you know, and it went up to like a hundred, right, over a six month period. And so it's like, you end up modeling all of this kind of noise to try to get to some sort of, you know, longitudinal um, understanding. So it's one of these things that really gives a lot of flexibility. It's not perfect, but it certainly gives you a lot of flexibility to model a lot of variability. Like it's used, these types of things are used a lot in hospitals, you know, settings where you're trying to model like, you know, observational data that wasn't part of like a clinical trial or something, right? So you just have a lot of 
people yeah, pa pa patients over time and some patients come to the hospital every few months some people come once you know it's like yeah and you have to kind of incorporate all of that those sources of variants so oh that's kind of what you're saying before like one of the some of the runners only ran one race some exactly 20 yeah. races and that can be that can be captured naturally this way yeah that's cool yeah but, yeah that's that's cool the the book actually didn't even mention that particular aspect but that seems like an important aspect yeah and then like you know i mean i don't know that we're going to get into this here but like you know one of the things you also have to deal with is okay let's say well i mean we're talking about races which presumably happen at the same time every year so you don't have to worry about that but like oh sure maybe yeah. one person has like two data points but they're like six months apart another person has two data points that are only two months apart it's like you have to model time as a continuous variable from like the baseline as a way of kind of dealing with that so that's one of your predictors is you know continue in like days or weeks or however you want to measure time anyway i'm rambling now so i'm just looking no, at the exercises it was, oh go ahead Amma. It was good to understand like with working with time that gives you a whole different dimension of not because most of the time we look at everything as cortex now exposures mm -hmm. and outcomes at the same time but then looking at okay Mm -hmm. How is the the temporality affecting what my exposure is, what my outcome is in the mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's like so you would want to model the effect of age, but you'd also want to model the effect of time from baseline as as another thing. So that would there's a lot of different sources anyway. Let's so looking at the exercise, I don't really see, you know, anything we could do as a group necessarily there's like you know the explain to your friend thing that's something worth thinking about right yeah um, i think i i just did that so <laughs> it's my yeah, yeah. my ability to explain to some friends yeah. <laughs> hakeem is yeah just back up the video hakeem and, yeah. and, and you're, and you're good. this does raise a question for me though i did met, kind of throw out their comment that hey you know with the complete pooling maybe you could try to do some kind of weighted prediction or something by com you know maybe making some kind of average i didn't really think mm -hmm. that through completely does that kind of thing is that kind of uh, kind of thing that's actually done or is that you what do you mean with the no problem? the no pooling that was the no pooling or, sorry no yeah, pooling. Okay. yeah separately fitting sure. everything together yeah. right and then so, like somehow averaging all the models across yeah you know, all, of, all of the i mean I don't think I mean I think you know there's a lot of model averaging and Bayesian stats but that's like the model is like um across the whole sample and they and they do and they run it like repeatedly right or something like it's like I don't maybe I'm wrong but I think they like, well I just trying to say if I was going to be completely naive and I didn't know anything about which I am some of it I didn't know anything <laughs> about Bayesian uh methods at all right I'm just gonna oh I'm just got these runners like well they're all you know I'm gonna fit them all separately I've got all these different lines some of them only have one data point I'm like well forget that guy and then I want to say, okay, now I, I'm just going to take the average slope or something and, and call yeah. that the, you know, the, I'm the I got to, I mean, I can make, I can make a little histogram, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the slopes, for example. And I go, oh, well, there's like, this is kind of the median slope, and I'll just use that. I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah I mean, maybe like you assign like a weight. It, wait, I guess you'd have to wait it too, right? Yeah. So, races. like, even, even like one of the things I was doing at work, it's like we got everyone's priors and then I just did it with, I just let Pi MC like shoot, like do the weighting for me. But it was from like a dare, dare collect uh, distribution. I wanted uh -huh, to do yeah. something like with that, but you do it with each individual slope. And then you just let it see like, oh, which one has like the most influence, right? And then you come out to like some weighted, you know, regression. Mm -hmm. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but just thought, I think it's thinking about yeah. what you're saying. I'm I just guess... wondering like how wrong I would be like if I said, okay, all I, all I know is basically, I don't even know anything about Bayesian, forget about that. I'm just talking about yeah. like old fashioned linear regression. So I fit all these lines and I'm like, okay, how, what's my best prediction for so-and-so to make this race? I go, well, you know, I mean, I guess I could predict here's, here's, let me, let me take the, an the average devil... prediction or something. I don't know. Here's, here's, here's the devil's advocate for why that wouldn't work is instead of, so if you do like just kind of averaging in the, no, in the, um, the no pooling situation, so you've got yeah. whatever, I mean, okay, so right, right now we only have 36 equations, right, because um, that we only have 36 people, but, 
you know, imagine we've got, you know, a lot more. I mean, so first of all, the number one thing would be just computational expense just to run yeah. like, you know, like 10,000, <laughs> let's, let's say there, let's say there's 10,000 runners or something like that. Right. Whatever. And then second of all, even if you did that, you wouldn't really know what factors contributed to that slope. That's, that's, you see what I'm saying? Like that's, it's right. all about, it's all about accounting for the variance in the, you know, in the slope across, you know, individuals um, and, you know, for what reason. So, I see. So then you, you could do yeah. that and you could say like, okay, on average, but then it's like, you, you're not, you're just, you're kind of just saying it'd, a little bit, it'd be a little bit like, you know, calculating the, you know, the average shoe size and then saying, you know, what's Robert's shoe size? Well, the average is eight and a half. Let's call it eight and a half, and that's the only thing that we're doing. Right, that, you know, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're not, we're not, we're not we, we don't have his age. We don't have his birth weight. I mean, there's a if we had a bunch of things, we could do a better job of predicting. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's that's good. That's a good, good um, mm -hmm. explanation of that. Good example. But it is, um, yeah, I, I it's an you, interesting. You point. have Sparky. Sorry. <laughs> What's that? Um, Ron has Sparky. Sparky. On your hat. On your oh, hat. I do have Sparky. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, from AS. Oh, from ASU. Is that what that is? Is that what that is? Oh. Yeah. Wow. I didn't. I don't even. What? I didn't even know that was the name of the the mascot. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went to ASU. So I was like, what is Sparky? Oh, oh wow. You did. Very oh. cool. Yeah. I didn't go to ASU. My son did, though, so I got the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Have not been, but uh, yeah, so that's a big institution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's uh, all I have. Let's see if any more comments. We'll have a nice early yeah. end today um, and get going on next week's reading. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. So. Have a good uh, meeting. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I got, got a whole afternoon of it. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. I will uh, see you guys uh, next week. All right, guys. See Bye. you next week. Bye. Bye.